Hi guys, and welcome to our next lesson. So we're gonna be continued uh, talking about a time period called the Enlightenment, right? And remember, it, the Enlightenment, it's uh, during this time that we see huge changes in the way that people view government. Uh, for the long history of the world, uh, there was a king, right? And it was his job to rule over the people and tell people what to do. And, you know, people didn't have a choice. These, these kings were known as um, absolute monarchs. And this means that they had total power, all the power, and that they got this power directly from God. And, you know, kings referred to this power as their divine right to rule, this idea that they got their power from God. And then during the Enlightenment, during this period of time that we're studying, uh, people began to question this concept that the king got his right to rule from God. And um, some people who challenged this idea, as we learned, were uh, Thomas Hobbes. Uh, now, Thomas Hobbes, remember, he still wanted a king, but he felt that a king was uh, necessary because people were naturally selfish and evil. And another person that we learned about was John Locke. And he said people are born into the world with natural rights, including life, liberty, and property. And he said, uh, because people are born with those things, uh, they, they then know when those things are violated or when someone tries to take them away. And it's natural for us to fight back when people try to do that. So John Locke said, uh, it's the role of the government to protect your basic rights, those basic rights, uh, those natural rights. So in John Locke's view, the government's purpose is to protect your rights. And this is why, for example, uh, the U.S. government, its one of its main jobs is uh, to protect us and to have a military, right? That's why that's in the Constitution. Now, some of the other Enlightenment thinkers we're going to talk about today include many philosophes. And the word philosoph simply is the French word for philosopher. And uh, this word is often used interchangeably with the phrase um, Enlightenment thinker. So we're learning about some other philosophes, other thinkers just like Thomas Hobbes and John Locke. Um, and philosophes were the people who represented the idea, the belief that everything in the universe could be known, that it could be classified and understood by people. And most of these philosophes were French philosophers during the Enlightenment. So they, most of them were from France, right? And their core beliefs that they shared, that were shared by these philosophes, include a belief in deism. And Deism, this means that they believed in the existence of God, but they denied any type of supernatural or miraculous occurrences. Um, they denied that those took place in the natural world. They don't believe in the supernatural, right? They, they basically compared God to a clockmaker, uh, just like a clockmaker creates a clock and they wind up the clock. And then after that, they allow it to operate and work on its own. They also believed that God created the world in the same way and that God allows it to operate on its own um, according to the natural laws of the world, uh, such as the law of gravity, for example. So deism placed a high importance on scientific theory and it asserted, uh, deists assert that supernatural things are impossible. So in their view, God exists, but does, he uh, doesn't interact personally with the universe. Uh, and this idea that they had, these religious views that they had, also meant that they tended to be more tolerant of other people's religious beliefs. Um, essentially, they viewed toleration as necessary to allow people to pursue reason and rationalism. And they did this because they wanted to discredit and debunk the divine right system of power that kings relied on, those absolutist kings. They uh, wanted to bring it down to debunk it. This system, this divine right system, this absolutist system opposed toleration and was based on Christian texts and principles, right? Remember I just said that the kings believed they got their power directly from God, right? And they believed it was the Christian God. Uh, so they used uh, Christian texts and principles to try to justify their power um, and to justify oppressing their subjects. So these philosophes, 
their goal was to bring together the original versions of the three Abrahamic religions, including Judaism and Christianity and Islam. And, you know, those original versions of it, they believed all taught morality and toleration in their original forms. And so they brought those original versions together into their own deistic worldview, right? Now, these philosophers are known to hang out they were known to hang out in these places called salons. Uh, and these places were where they organized gatherings. And that's where these organized gatherings were hosted. And typically it took place in private homes and were, they were usually held by prominent or important women in society. And the guests at these salons usually came from the upper class, the nobility, right? So most of them were well-educated, they were well-read and informed about politics. Um, they were informed on current affairs and intellectual debates that were happening. And by the last quarter of the 18th century, so the last 25 years of the 1700s, the salons, these places had become basically kind of like universities or tutorial groups. And they really specialized in enlightenment ideas and philosophy. So the salons were social gatherings. They weren't, they weren't revolutionary parties or groups, right? But they served as a place where revolutionary ideas and debates could be discussed. Um, the salons, these places, provided the venue for sharing, floating, and discussing uh, liberal enlightenment ideas and for criticizing the older, more traditional views of the world and of government, right? And some uh, enlightenment thinkers or philosophers include people like Diderot, uh, Benjamin Franklin, Montesquieu, Rousseau, and Adam Smith, who we will talk more about uh, later. Now, let's talk a little bit about uh, enlightened despots or enlightened absolutists. And these people were, people were rulers during the 18th century, during the 1700s, who attempted to apply the principles of the Enlightenment to their kingdoms. Um, a lot of philosophers like Voltaire and Diderot and Immanuel Kant supported strong monarchy as the best tool to implement the goals and ideals of the Enlightenment. Uh, they thought this would be the best way to topple the nobility and the power of the church. And some thought that this change was going to change from the top down. Uh, they had a top down approach and they thought a philosopher king was necessary for the ideas and principles of the Enlightenment to be uh, enacted and implemented. So the first one is Frederick II. No, he's also known as Frederick the Great of Prussia. So Frederick the Great is seen as the most successful of these absolutists, of these enlightened absolutists. Um, and he saw himself as the first servant of the state uh, he, to rule over the country. And he believed, you know, he needed to be considerate and care about the welfare of his subjects. So he was opposed to Niccolo Machiavelli, if you remember from our lesson yes, uh, the other day. Uh, Niccolo Machiavelli, he argued um, that the best ruler is deceitful, that he lies and he's manipulative and does everything that he can to get and to preserve his own power. And Frederick argued against this. And Frederick the Great instead said that a ruler should be concerned about the well-being of his subjects. Um, Frederick even uh, wrote back and forth. He corresponded with Voltaire, who is a thinker we're going to discuss later. And Voltaire was a regular guest at his court before their relationship kind of turned sour. Now, um, because Frederick is concerned about the welfare of his people, he pushed for the advancement of science and agriculture, and he ended up establishing the Prussian Academy of Science. Um, and in terms of religious toleration, Frederick expanded religious toleration in Prussia, in his kingdom. But... Uh, he still favored Protestants for most key government positions, but Frederick also reformed his state. He reformed the civil service. Basically, he reformed how people were going to be selected to serve in his administration, uh, in his government. And over a hundred years before the United States had a civil service exam, a test, right, to determine if you could serve in the government, 
Frederick was already instituting this reform so that people got promoted uh, to positions on, on, on a basis of merit to what we call a meritocracy so that it didn't matter quite as much what noble family you came from. Uh, if you wanted to serve in the civil administration, you, you might be able to. And this greatly helped to improve the efficiency of the government. Now let's move on to Catherine the Great of Russia. Uh, so she was the wife of the Russian Tsar, and uh, her husband, the Tsar, he died mysteriously, and it's likely that he was assassinated and that she probably had something to do with his assassination. Um, now, during her, her reign, there wasn't a lot of reform because she still was very much dependent on the support of the nobility. Now, uh, she was uh, the least ambitious in terms of reform, but she corresponded and interacted and wrote letters back and forth with the philosophes during this period. Uh, for example, she, she found out that Diderot, who we're going to talk about today, who was the editor of the encyclopedia, she found out he had run into some troubles, financial troubles. And so she decided to purchase his library. But instead of just taking everything from him, right, that would, that would not be good for him as a philosopher to lose all of his books. So instead of taking it, everything from him, she buys it and she says, hey, why don't you be my librarian? And she ends up paying him a salary and allows him to maintain access to all those important books and publications that he needed. Uh, she also wrote with Voltaire, and because of these this correspondence, she had good relationships with these philosophes, and they wrote really well about her. They had a lot of good things to say about her. Uh, and then during uh, her reign, there was a rebellion in Russia from some peasants and Cossacks, and she ends up putting down this rebellion, partly due to you know her dependence on the nobility, right? So she. She didn't really make any serious legal changes to address the complaints of the people who who rebelled. So um, there was this rebellion. She ends up putting them down and doesn't do much to actually change anything in response. Um, you know, she defended her absolute rule, uh, right? But she didn't enact too many reforms. But she did speak out against serfdom. And serfdom was this status that peasants had under feudalism, and it existed from the Middle Ages in Europe to about the mid-1800s in some parts of Europe. And basically serfdom, it means that the people, the peasants were bound to the land. They were servants. They could not travel freely. Uh, they had to stay put and grow food and do what the lords told them to do. They were the property of the landlord or the noble. Right? So they were tied to the land. That's what serfdom is. So Catherine the Great spoke out against this. Uh, so she was critical of it. But she didn't do anything. She didn't pass any reforms to eliminate or end serfdom. Um, another thing that she did was that she praised Voltaire for fighting enemies of the state. And she clearly had a good relationship with Voltaire, uh, who we will talk more about. Now, the next person is Joseph II of Austria. He's the next enlightened despot. So Joseph, we need to keep in mind that he was the most radical and he was also the least effective of the enlightened despots. Uh, his goals were overly ambitious and not everybody in, was in, in agreement with those ideas. So uh, for the first 15 years of his reign, he reigned alongside his mother, Maria Teresa. And then after that, after... Uh, that uh, period, he then rules on his own. And he traveled, he's known for traveling amongst his own subjects. He was dressed in, his, in disguise in order to learn more about them and the issues that they had and to learn about some of the problems that they faced. Um, one of his biggest reforms is he pushed for religious toleration, even for Jews. And that was pretty radical during this period. So. Uh, Joseph was very generous in terms of religious toleration, and his policy allowed for the private worship, like private worship in homes, and uh, especially for Jews, right? He wanted to bring Jews into the Austrian nation. And keep in mind also that this is also a feature of this um, enlightened despotism uh, to centralize the state and to increase the absolute power of the king. Uh, 
Now, uh, Joseph was presiding over a multi-ethnic empire. This is the Austrian Empire was very it had a lot of different groups that lived a, inside the empire. And when we get to World War One, we'll talk more about that and those problems that come from this. You know, from from Austria having so many different ethnic groups with different cultures and languages. But so a lot of people, because of that that fact that there's so many different ethnic groups in Austria. A lot of people aren't happy with him trying to centralize state power. And the local nobles were, they pushed back against him. Uh, but he nevertheless, he was a reformer. He abolished serfdom in Austria, which is very big. He granted more rights to peasants. And he was trying to give them more than they had ever had before. Um, and unfortunately, after he died, a lot of his reforms were undone by his successors. And that's why he's not really known as like Catherine the Great or Frederick the Great. Um, that's why he doesn't really have that title because a lot of his things, his reforms were undone after him. So these philosophs, uh, you know, the ph philosophs influenced these rulers, right? So make sure to, you know, read in your textbook on uh, pages 63 to 65. It talks more about the impact that the philosophs had on these leaders um, and as you can see in this quote here, it says, all religions must be tolerated for every man must get to heaven in his own way. And that really reflects what I've just been talking about with Joseph II, who pushed for religious toleration, as did Frederick II. Uh, so make sure that if uh, you can read that in your text, it'll help to provide more of a context for what we're learning. Now, the next Enlightenment leader that comes along so we learned about Hobbes, we learned about uh, John Locke. The next one is Jean-Jacques Rousseau, and he's French, and he writes a book called The Social Contract. Now, he's actually the first, he's not the first philosopher, he's not the first philosopher to write about this social contract. Uh, as we know, Hobbes and Locke have discussed the social contract before him. Uh, anyways, Rousseau states that the government is, uh, is actually a contract. It's a contract, and when we sign a contract, a contract is an agreement between people, right? So a contract between the government and the people is called a social contract. And Rousseau says that the government's job is to protect life, liberty, and property. And because people have a contract, uh, they have a right to back out of that contract if the government fails to do its job and protect those rights. So Rousseau says that people have the power to create a new government if that is what's going on, if the government is failing to do its duty. Uh, and he's also tackling what, you know, in this book, The Social Contract, he tackles the idea of like, you know, what makes a government legitimate? And uh, according to Rousseau, a legitimate government is a government that reflects the general will. And uh, Rousseau is thinking more about the whole society. He's not just focusing on individual rights, but he's thinking about the general will and the collective, right? And so um, he focused on the nature of government and that the idea that life is all about self-preservation. And a lot of his ideas in the social contract, his, his views gave our country uh, its political views on government, on the idea that we have rights and equality, right? And uh, he believed that man was neither inherently good nor bad, but that man is corrupted by our society. And his ideas were very influential. They influenced the American as well as French revolutions. And like I said, his writings really answered the question of how, how government should exist, how uh, government is legitimate, whether it's legitimate or not, right? And so a good tip for remembering Jean-Jacques Rousseau and his ideas is the S's, Rousseau, S -S -S -O, there's all these S's in his name, and that goes with society, right? So he was thinking about the social contract and this, the idea that there's a contract between uh, the society, the government, and the individual. And there's a such thing as, um, you know, the, the, this social contract that uh, exists between the government and the people, and that if one 
does not uphold its end of the contract, that the people have a right uh, and the power to create a new government and to create a new contract. Now, the next Enlightenment thinker is a man named Baron de Montesquieu. So Montesquieu wrote a book called The Spirit of the Laws, and in it, he's discussing what is the best way to organize government how to organize government on enlightenment principles. And Montesquieu is known today because he greatly influenced the government of the United States. Now, he doesn't invent the idea that's known as the separation of powers. As we studied in our unit on Rome, the Romans had divided the powers of government long before. But remember that this period is when Europeans rediscovered some things from Rome and Greece. And so Montesquieu had researched uh, the Romans quite a bit, and he looked to them for guidance on how to set up a republic. And he says, uh, after doing all this research, you know, what if the same government that is protecting your natural rights, uh, the rights that John Locke talks about, what if that same government tries to use its power to infringe on your natural rights? Um, and he's thinking about human nature. Uh, he's thinking about, you know, that it's it's not good for one person to have all kinds of power. Um, he disagrees with some people on this. Like, he disagrees with Voltaire because Voltaire, like I said, believed the best way to bring about the Enlightenment was to have a sort of philosopher king, somebody who can bring about the Enlightenment from the top down uh, because he believed it was unlikely to happen from the bottom up. But Montesquieu disagrees with this. He disagrees with Voltaire. He thought we can't just have one person in power because when you look at the history of the world, when you when you observe history, when when one person gets power, it usually does a lot more harm than good. Uh, he believed that selfishness and jealousy is what guides people. So he put forth this idea, the idea of the separation of powers. And he believed the government should some, look something like this, that there should be an executive branch, a legislative branch, and a judicial branch. And today we see that in our government, which the executive is the president, right? The legislative branch of government is the Congress, which makes laws. And then you have the judicial branch, which today we have the Supreme Court, and they interpret the laws. And uh, you know, each part of government, according to uh, Montesquieu, should have different powers to check one another, uh, to, to basically provide oversight and prevent one branch of government from having all the power and from becoming too powerful. So he argued for dividing the powers of government so that they could check one another. And he believed this was the best way to preserve our freedom, to prevent tyranny and uh, someone from becoming a dictator. So it was a way to protect our freedom and our liberty. And it was very influential over uh, James Madison, who is known as the father of the Constitution, who we will talk more uh, about later. And so he was very influential on how our Constitution and our how our form of government was constructed. Now, the next person uh, for this lesson uh, is uh, Dennis Diderot. And he lived from 1713 to 1784. And he was a French author and editor. And he's best known as the editor of the encyclopedia, which is, of course, a French word, uh, although it's spelt and pronounced a little differently. Basically, the encyclopedia was a collaborative effort to compile and distribute a wide var variety of um, knowledge from an enlightened perspective. Um, about 4,250 copies of his encyclopedia were printed. Um, Diderot was also a poet, right? He wrote uh, that poetry must have something in it that is barbaric, vast, and wild, right? And he had a lot of fun with poetry. And one of his most often quoted poems is when he wrote, um, his hands would plate the priest's entrails for want of a rope to strangle, the, strangle kings. So he's saying in that quote, he's saying that the lover of liberty, the lover of freedom, he's going to take the priest's intestines and strangle the kings to death. Uh, so although he was joking when he wrote this, uh, sometimes the jokes went a little too far. So uh, one time he played a joke on his friend and he wrote a book called The Nun. And remember, the Enlightenment is not necessarily friendly to 
establishment religion, right? So he was kind of making fun of religion a little bit. And he writes these fake letters pretending to be a young woman in a convent, a nun. And he writes these letters pretending that he's this girl who was taken against her will, uh, taken to a convent to be a nun, how miserable she is. And um, he's he's pretending to be this girl who's appealing to this guy, who, his friend, to get him to come save her. And at some point, Diderot says, psych, I've been writing this all along. It's not really this girl. Uh, I've been pretend pretending to be this girl. And his friend is basically like, laughs it off and he's like, ha, huh, you got me. <laughs> and so it all started as a joke, but a lot of people read this book, The Nun. They read these letters after he published it and, ex and it really exposed them to a lot of the horrors and miserable experiences that people, especially some young women, were facing during this period of time uh, as a result of established religion as they were uh, living in convents, right? But um, like I said, he he's most known for editing and composing the encyclopedia. And his purpose was to change the general way of thinking. Uh, the idea was that people are, are not stuck in this life, but could take charge and improve their existence through, through knowledge, right? Through gaining knowledge. And that's what his, his purpose, his goal was for um, writing and composing, editing the encyclopedia. It was to distribute as much knowledge as possible in a wide variety of it. And the next thinker is Voltaire. And Voltaire did a lot of writing. And one major focus of his writing is on the idea that government should be separated from the church. So as you see, it says he used his pen to fight the, uh, the abuses of the day. He wrote over 21,000 letters. So like I said, he did a lot of writing. And a lot of that focus in his writing was on the idea that government should be separated from the church. Uh, and his idea... Well, you know, he detested the slave trade and inequality, and he was imprisoned for attacking the Catholic Church. And it's probably because he uh, was imprisoned by, uh, you know, you know, from as a result of attacking the Catholic Church. That's probably why he was critical of religion, right? Um, so he spoke out against the slave trade. He spoke out against equality, inequality. And he spoke out against the church because of this. And the idea that he comes up with is um, that the state, the government, should be separate from any kind of religious practice so that there is more tolerance in society. Um, he spoke out against religious fanaticism because often these kings, these uh, absolutist kings, would try to force their religion on the people and use their religion to maintain their unjust power over the people. So Voltaire wanted to separate that. He wanted there to be a clear separation between religion and the government and the king, right? He didn't want religion being used in this way. He wanted tolerance. Uh, so he's known for fighting for civil rights and for freedom of religion. And as you can see in this quote, he says, an ideal form, an ideal form of government is democracy tempered with assassination, right? So... Um, he was also known for speaking out in favor of uh, monarchy, but he believed in an uh, enlightened monarchy. Uh, he, like I said, he believed in a top-down approach. He believed that in order to bring about the ideas and principles of the Enlightenment, that you needed a strong authoritarian um, who would be able to do that. Uh, the only difference is he didn't want him to the king to be uh, controlled by the church and to be uh, persecuting people based off their religious beliefs. So he didn't believe necessarily in uh, democracy and having these changes brought about by the common people. That's not really what he was uh, pushing for, but he was pushing for uh, these enlightenment ideals of uh, freedom of religion, especially. Uh, so, we are going to stop here for this lesson, and then in our next lesson, we're going to talk about some other famous Enlightenment thinkers. So make sure that if you have any questions, let me know. Hopefully you learned something from this lesson. Make sure to email me or to reach out during our Google meeting, and I'll try my best to help you. So good luck.